Good afternoon and welcome to Shared Sampler Threads. My name is Heather Johnson, Senior Manager at Woodlawn and Pope Leahy House, and I am excited to introduce this virtual program. Shared Sampler Threads is being presented as part of Woodlawn's 59th Annual Needleworks Show, which will be running for the rest of the month of March. We will have an online version of the show available in April for those who are not able to join us in person. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for being here. This is a reminder that this program will be recorded. If you have any questions during the presentation, please leave them in the comments or chat section to the right of your screen. We will address them in the Q&A section at the end. To open our program, I would like to highlight Woodlawn's history with embroidery and samplers. Nellie Custis Lewis, the first owner of Woodlawn Plantation, was the granddaughter of Martha Washington, George Washington's wife. It was Martha who taught her granddaughter to embroider. Today we have some pictures of their works, which are currently on display for the Needleworks show. First is a cushion embroidered by Martha Washington in 1801. As you can see, it was a shell design in beautiful red and yellow. Here's a little bit more detail. The back of the cushion had a note which reads, this cushion was worked at Mount Vernon by Mrs. M. Washington in the 70th year of her age. For Lorenzo Lewis, her grandson, left by his mother E. P. Lewis. Next, we have a bookmark embroidered by Nellie Lewis. It is a silk ribbon with perforated paper. And here's some detail. It is accompanied by a handwritten note that reads, a part of the ribbon worn by Mrs. General Washington on her wedding day, the work, her granddaughter's Mrs. Lewis. Woodlawn has many connections to embroidery, but the final item we have time to touch on today is through the Quakers, who bought and lived on the property in the early 19th century, early to mid 19th century, after the Lewises. Embroidery was an important part of life for Quakers, Quaker girls and women. And though we don't have any of their works in our collections, we will get to see work that was made by Quaker women in Virginia and Maryland with today's guest speaker. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Barbara Hudson. Barbara is an independent needlework researcher, author, and owner of Queenstown Sampler Designs. Barbara's designs can be found in shops worldwide, and her embroideries have been awarded ribbons in prestigious needlework shows in the United States. She has published articles about historic samplers in Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly and The Gift of Stitching. Barbara has been a volunteer for Maryland and Delaware Sampler ID Days with Dr. Gloria Seaman Allen in participation with the Sampler Consortium Project and Dr. Lynn Anderson. Barbara is the co-author of the section on Chester County Connections in the 2014 catalog, Wrought with Careful Hand, Ties of Kinship on Delaware Samplers, Biggs Museum of American Art, Dover, Delaware. Barbara has worked with numerous American museums and sampler scholars, helping them identify samplers in their collections. This year during our Needlework show, Barbara's reproduction sampler work has been on display all month long in a special exhibition entitled, Historic Samplers from Around the World and at Home. Today, she brought several antique samplers to share with our visitors. She will be sharing stories and histories about many of the samplers today. Welcome, Barbara. Such stitch such and fabric collections may have been assembled in a number of cultures where embroidery for decorative effect was widely practiced. Few pieces have survived in rare cases. Early examples were formed, found in Egyptian burial grounds, probably dating from the 14th or 15th centuries. The earliest known linen cloth was made in Egypt 5,500 years 
BC. References to embroidery can be found in the First Testament of the Bible. Samplers and embroidery are written about in early literature. You can certainly see uh, early uh, paintings with women doing their embroidery in a window, just like this. <laughs> Archaeologists have found in Africa needles made from bone that are 61,000 years old and even older in Sweden and Norway, 65,000 years old. The first printed pattern book for embroidery was published by textile printer Johann Schoenstrucker in Augsburg, Germany in 1523. That's 500 years ago. And it was followed by others in Germany, Italy, France, and England, borrowing extensively from each other with or without acknowledgement. Copyright didn't happen until last century. Uh, why do we love samplers? I'm an embroiderer. And bring you great joy. Samplers are the only antiques in existence that were made by children. It's the only thing we collect that children made. These children were well educated, sent to school, or a tutor was brought to their home to teach them. Their parents took great care of them. Samplers are the most tangible evidence of female education. Wow. Okay, sorry. Uh, and their parents were usually prosperous merchants or farmers. I rescue these works of art to preserve, to own, to display the work of the young girls and women who were alive a long time ago, as far as the Mayflower, to glimpse something of their schooling, their homes, their families, holds an irresistible appeal to me. It is always exciting to be part of the rediscovery of history, the changing significance through the centuries of embroidery in the lives of women from royalty, royalty to ordinary school children is completely fascinating to me. Motifs were often full of symbolism, passed from generation to generation over centuries and across national boundaries by means of pattern books, borrowed examples, but the patterns were not permanent. They traveled and they evolved. There are hundreds of embroidery techniques and thousands of patterns. Simply, we are talking about embroidery worked in hand with a threaded needle using two basic methods, counted or freestyle embroidery. Uh, let's see. One of the things that uh, the samplers first started being with, um, and, and well, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Samplers started off being a uh, form of keeping the pattern and learning, <clears throat> knowing where, where your patterns were, usually rolled up into a, a casket, if you will. Later on, in the 18th century, uh, in England, the moral uh, issue of relief for the poor was being taken up by philanthropists who had made fortunes in commerce. Some institutions and schools were built to improve life expectancy and to provide some hope for the needy. Useful needlework and sampler making, in some cases, a purely re recreational adjunct formed a significant portion of the curriculum. Household linen, clothing, etc., continued to be handmade, marked, repaired, and embellished by women folk. Her ability to read and, if necessary, to write her name was becoming an important consideration in addition to needlework skills when a gentleman was seeking a wife. The sample was turning into a diploma rather than a tool to remember techniques. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to go around the room. I'm going to get up. <laughs> and be louder. <laughs> and we're going to go around the room, seeing some of the samplers that I brought today some of the antiques and everything that's around the room. There's quite a few here. We have 31 models from the Queenstown Sampler Designs, and I brought six antiques for you all to see. So, Jessica, let me go this way. And the first one we have here is the 1650 Circa Band Sampler. I'm not sure if it's American or English. In the earliest form, samplers were put together as a personal reference works for the embroiderers. Um, with the composition of band sampling becomes the first clear indication in England of the form being used as a method of instruction and practice for girls learning needlework. Because they, as I said earlier, because they were never meant to be displayed, they were kept rolled up in, for family reference. And this is the reason they have survived such good condition. The next one on the table is Ruth Kane. She's a Pennsylvania Quaker. She was born in 1794. This, and she's in my collection. Her sister sampler, Sarah Kane, is in the collection of the American Museum, Bath, England. 
uh, a relative, it came down through the family and the relative was a diplomat, I forget exactly, but when they were in England, they <clears throat> donated it to that museum. Uh, and I believe that our King sisters, I know that they were from New Garden, Chester County, and they may have been taught by teachers E.B. Harvey, S.P.H., B. Wine School. Some of you may recognize these names, but these were uh, two sisters and a sister-in-law, all living in the same area. So a lot of things are familiar there. Next, we have Ann Mott. She's a New York Quaker. Uh, we have one medallion here, and then we have the, the facing birds, uh, which mean emblem of love. Uh, it's the center of attention. There are several animals in 1813 living in New York State that could have made the sampler. There was one girl living on Long Island. A couple girls are found in Dutchess County, close to the Quaker Nun Partner School, where Mr. Adam Mott was superintendent. His son, James Mott, taught at Nine Partner School for two years, where he met his distant cousin and future wife, Lucretia Coffin, then a student and then later a teacher's aide. They married 10 April 1811 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Their daughter, Anna, was born 6 August 1812. So their daughter could not have made that same. Yeah, it's a little young, one years old. They had five more children. Lucretia Coffin Mott is one of the most significant women of the 19th century. Lucretia and James Mott were abolitionists, leaders in women's rights, and social reformers. Their children continued their efforts as well. In 1864, Lucretia was on the committee that incorporated Swarthmore College. Lucretia insisted it would be co-educational, <clears throat> one of the first in America to do so. After the Civil War, Lucretia would go on to found the American Equal Rights Association with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. So now you realize why I had to have that Mott sampler, <laughs> because there's just so much history with the Mott family. And up here we have um, the Bathsheba Brown, 1830. She lived from 1811 to 1895. She was born in New Jersey, but her family removed to Ohio by 1815 to Preble County. Her sister-in-law, Sarah Ballinger Brown, made a similar sample. And I don't know if you can see it in the here, but it's in the uh, Studebaker book on page 103. Here's a picture of... Uh, her. They, they were sister-in-laws. I said that, didn't I? Okay. Uh, then we have up here, we have this sweet little uh, Emily Hudson, 1843. She's a pendulous grape basket, which is this motif here. And Dr. Lynn Anderson from the Stanford Consortium, Stanford Archives, and I have been um, identifying and locating lots of those samplers just to show you how a simple sampler a simple motif on a sampler and how it evolves and moves around the country and where it goes. And it's, it's just a fascinating subject. Uh, Dr. Anderson has done a wonderful talk on that too. And then we have the Bristol School sampler here. It's a Quaker uh, boarding school and day school. 1817, Mary Wright. She lived from 1808 to 1868. And very few Bristol School samplers have been documented. There have been a few. You can go on to Amy Finkel's website, which is M. Finkel and Daughter Antiques. She has a few um, that she's talked about before. You can learn a little bit more about it, but it's just a wonderful. You have the facing birds. You have uh, the acorns coming off of the eight-pointed star flower, fruit basket. Oh, that's so very typical, plus the um, quicker alphabets. I'm sorry, I haven't taken her out of her frame, but there she is in all her glory. So let's go to the door. And the door. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one gets these sick. Here we are with Phoebe Nichols, 1824. Uh, her decorative sampler has many, many characteristics of early building samplers of eastern Frederick County, Maryland, from the Quaker settlement of Sam's and Pipe Creeks, now in Carroll County, Maryland. Today it's named Union Bridge. These samplers were taught by Mar Margaret Cochran, 
between the years 1816 and 1820, there are at least six additionally known samplers worked between 1816 and 1824 that are attributed to Cochrane. Phoebe may have attended the school. Union Bridge is only about 50 miles from Goose Creek, which is where he was born and raised. And she may have been a student or some, a student of Corcoran came and taught in Virginia in Loudoun County. So we had cousins living at the New Bridge, so could have gone with the right now. Um, the one below it is Sarah Conway, 1825. She's a Pennsylvania Quaker. Her parents were John and Rebecca Bud Conley, both teachers at West Town, Chester County, Pennsylvania, another Quaker school. But most of the sample people know about. Later, they started their own school at Byberry, Pennsylvania, called Lessons Hill. John wrote school books used by the Pennsylvania State School. Uh, what's interesting about this one, it has the rare motifs of figures, female, uh, female and male figures there, there's a pair of them, and an interesting squirrel. Typical Quaker figures on samples of squirrels, birds, and swans, but rarely do you see uh, people and other animals. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Sarah Collins, for those of you who watch PBS and uh, follow the Finding Your Roots, I happened to be watching the time when Kevin Bacon was on that show, and this is his ancestor. Sarah Conway. Now the one that's in the fireplace is Maria Januaria, 1833, from Portugal. She was 17 when she created her sampler. The sampler resembles a cast of characters in a play. The list of players include Adam and Eve, ladies and gentlemen, children, soldiers, sailors, and perhaps a pirate. They travel for your amusement by land in a carriage or by donkey. And then by sea in a ship, they appear to be everyday folks falling in love. One lady is sitting in a chair holding her key, perhaps the key to her heart. I have seen the lady in a chair motif on other, two other Portuguese samples. There's also a windmill, a three-story house, and an abundance of flowers, all surrounded by a border that is different on each side. Crowned, doubled, curved hearts with the key to the heart of a young miss expressing her love so her young man continues in Portugal today. The symbols can be found in jewelry, embroidery, and other art forms. There is a memorial motif with the initials IRC. Her sampler maker only pays trip, also plays tribute to Maria Joana, who could have been her teacher. And that is just so loaded with so many fabulous things. One of my favorite, favorite samples of all time. I purchased it from a antique dealer in Lisbon, Portugal. Online. I didn't go there. I would like to go there. <laughs> Someday. So we'd like to come up. In the center on top, we have Sarah Haynes, 1848. And the original is in the Maryland Historical Society. And uh, this is just a fabulous piece. Just love her to death. She was from the Frederick County area of Maryland. Uh, now, Carol County, forgot they came here. Change the boundaries on me. To the right, we have Hannah Longstreth, a woman, fabulous Quaker from Phoenixville, Chester County, Pennsylvania, whose father actually started that city. Yeah, the wonderful thing about Hannah Longstreth, she's an ancestor direct line ancestor of my grandniece, Anna Longstreth, who was born in 2001. 100% of the chart proceeds go to her education fund. I did an extensive, the most extensive Longstreth history all the way back to Henry VII in England. So there's a lot there. <laughs> and just a fabulous, wonderful sample with all those lovely little motifs. And the squirrel, Quaker squirrel, most of us know that. And if you'd like to go to the next one, on top is a Virginia sampler. That's Elizabeth J. M. Mears. She lived from 1819 to 1888 in Accomac County, Virginia, on the eastern shore of Virginia. We're pretty sure she attended Margaret's Academy. It was the only one in town. 
Kim Ivey's book, and the Meet is Commander, talks about the group of samples. And if you can see the, co uh, the cover there, they're very much alike. So Kim and I are pretty sure that someone who learned her sampler making down close to Colonial, Colonial Williamsburg, uh, then took her skills to the Eastern Shore and started teaching at Margaret Academy later on, because we know of at least three more samplers from Accomack County that look very similar to that, to our Miss Mears. Underneath Miss Mears is Margaret Ann Kleindienst, 1830 from Baltimore, Maryland. The one thing I can tell you about this when, when we were researching the sampler, well, several things. First thing was you can spell her name at least 24 different ways in the records. And the second thing is always read transcribed documents for yourself because translations and errors occur. And it's, what's nice about Ancestry.com, now you can view a lot of documents right online. Uh, 10 years ago, they weren't available. So I had to ask the, um, Church, of the Church of the Latter-day Saints to send me the microfiche to the closest library, their library, which was in Annapolis at their church. And I came and I looked at it and figured out that someone had made an error when they wrote down the uh, records for her. And there was no doubt she was from Baltimore. But when we were doing the book back in Prior to 2007, I couldn't prove it yet. So now we have up on top one of the most fabulous samplers, uh, Lancaster County. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> Mary Ann Bailey, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, from the Mary Ekman School. Let me just put my finger up here so I can point out it says Maria E here. Uh, we know quite a few samplers now from this school. And on another sampler, it does have her full name of Maria Ekman. And she tells us that she was in Coleraine Township, Lancaster County. Uh, we know of at least five Ekman samplers, taught Ekman taught samplers, two more similar from the Sarah Ann Baker School, who obviously was a student of Mar Maria Ekman because so many things are alike. And um, she continued. Teach, she started teaching after our Maria Ekman married, and she Maria stopped. Below, oh, point out, can you get a close up of these very puffy, puffy animals? We have a cow, we have some sheep, and we have a little dog there too, next to the blue house. So, and I'm going to tell people right now if uh, you have. Uh, the charts, and you would like some close-up photos or works in progress, just email me and I will send you my work in progress photographs, which are very helpful when you're working with something that you're not familiar with, like those puffy guys. All right, below that we have a Mexican sampler that I don't know the name. She didn't put her name on it, but it's so delightful with so many colors in that. Uh, my husband refers to this to this uh, sampler as Blue Monkey 2. And that's because that's the second Mexican sampler we bought that has a blue monkey. Uh, we're up to about nine now. So nine Blue Monkey samples from Mexico. Yeah. Some of them are quite blue, some of them are gray, but yeah, blue, who, who knew? So very pretty, so colorful and fun. So nice. I'm going to come over here and show you, skip a couple and show you this one here. This is Liddy Rose. Um, Liddy Rose was from Winchester, Frederick County's Historical Society, and that's in their collection. We believe Liddy is Lydia Winfield Rose Writings, born 20 July 1799 in Virginia. And next to that, we have Francis Schwartz, 1842. And this one, has, has a Quaker influence and Pennsylvania German influence. And I can't prove it, but I believe it could have been started by her mother. It's hard to read the writing. I'm sorry, that's the colors that were on the sampler. But uh, he has the mother's birth date, 
a lot of these um, motifs are found on samplers by a Quaker taught uh, school in Belfont, Center County, Pennsylvania. In fact, the first sampler that Betty Ring ever bought, uh, Betty Ring being, you know, the goddess of sampler research from the 60s up until she passed, um, the first sampler she bought was one that had those motifs and like that. She wrote about it in her double volume book uh, about that teacher, and I can't think of their name off the top of my head, I'm sorry. So it's a fabulous sample. There's a lot going on there. But the reason I think it's a mother-daughter thing, they were both named Francis. And uh, later on, the colors changed where the young girls putting in all the family initials and some other things. Um, the colors are different than what is in the rest of the sampler, but you know, hard to say, but it's a fun thing to think about. Um, We'll go back to the table if we can. This is 1717 from uh, the northern part of the Netherlands. It's known as the area is called Friesland. There's multiple alphabets to mark household goats. You can see all the, the <laughs> different alphabets, different sizes from the in, little tiny to the very, very big. Uh, one of the things uh, that I love about freezing samplers are all the wonderful household items that you see there. There's a ship with 15 sailors. There was one motif, we weren't sure what the heck it was, but we think the circus was coming to town because we have a little caged uh, cart pulled by a horse and a man there. Not sure what's inside the cage. Could be, you know, people dressed up or it could be monkeys. I really don't know, but it's a cute little thing. All kinds of things going on there. This fabulous feather tree, very typical from that era of time period. It's just a wonderful, wonderful sampler. Again, 1717, very early, very nice. I'm always thrilled when I find something fabulous like that. And we come to Jessica's favorite sampler, the Sarah Worrell, 1790, she's quite and again, I don't use the term rare very often, but this one is rare because of all the figures that you can see there. There's a lot of German influence here with the deer and the border. Sarah was born at Edgemont, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. This sampler is a spectacular work of art. Sarah was nine years old when she created her embroidery. Her sampler has a pretty carnation border with strawberry corners. Uh, you can see the two colored sawtooth rows of satin stitch. She's done it a couple times there. Very pretty. And uh, there are several pairs of birds, including parrots and a peacock couple. A rambling bear makes an appearance down in the left corner. And there's gigantic red hearts that rest under flowery trees. The Sidbacher deers that we call, we've heard to uh, those deers are Sidbacher. Chart was published in 1590 and then again in 1604. Sarah included an Isaac Watts hymn spelling along with the English proverb, which is extremely hard to see. She did it in such light color. Um, so it says, in times of prosperity, our friends are plenty, but in times of adversity, there is scarce one in 20. Sarah recorded her family members on the sampler. She was a member of the Society of Friends, Quaker. There is a more detailed history and the travels of the sampler further in the chart path. It was quite a journey we embarked on figuring it all out. Quickly said, I bought this sampler from a dealer in uh, Southwest Ohio, close to Dayton. I couldn't figure out how that sampler got to Ohio because Sarah, and all her uh, next couple generations family all stayed in Pennsylvania and they're all buried there. So how did that sampler get there? Well, it seems um, when I was doing the research, of course, I found out her mother married a second time, a uh, Mr. Pancoast. Well, one of his children and grandchildren all moved to the Dayton area and they took her sampler with them. So there. there. There was that mystery. Ruth Passmore is up above, and 
It says Ruth Passmore, 1804, B Wine School, SPH, which stands for Branty Wine School of Wilmington, Delaware. And the teacher was Susanna Pusey Harvey. She's actually known as the preceptress, or, you know, the supreme being of the school, Mother Superior. Those of us that went to Catholic school. Okay. So she's been in. Um, several exhibits from the big exhibit catalog that I referenced earlier, and she's in the Delaware Discoveries uh, sampler book that came out recently. Um, Co-authors uh, Cindy Steinhoff and, of course, Gloria Seaman Allen, who recently has passed away. And there were so many fabulous people. One of the things I absolutely loved doing these past 20 years is sampler ID days going around to all these wonderful museums and things and working with some of the most fabulous people. All the girls in, um, girls, <laughs> women in Delaware and Maryland and Virginia and DC area and all the wonderful people that have brought their samplers in for us to identify and look at and just, you know, drool over. It's just been a wonderful experience. And uh, we've had so many helps from we had great help from all the different sampler guilds, the Delaware Historical Valley Sampler Guild, the Loudon Sampler Guild, so many others. It's just been wonderful when we can all get together and discuss all these things and learn so much from each other. So we can all my soapbox there. So we have one of the Jordan sisters, and this is Elizabeth Jordan. I don't know if you want to pan out to see both of them right now. Uh, you, you don't have to. Uh, we call this uh, eyeglasscape, um, referring to this eyeglasscape uh, Baltimore samples. It's the only place we have found them. We found them from 1808 up until almost 1850. Many different schools were using it in Baltimore, different houses, different trees, usually something a little different, but um, the border on that one is similar to the sisters and a couple others that are in the Baltimore Museum of Art. So it's wonderful when we can, and that's how we were able to date that. Plus we found who Elizabeth and Anne were, and they are who are the daughters. And I'm gonna get that next step. Okay. Um, the parents were Charles and Sophia Jordan and they, are first mentioned in the Baltimore City Directory in 1822, which is wonderful when you're doing research. City directories and finding out who, what the father, who the father and the mother were and what kind of uh, store they were, were having. And it just, it, it's just one more thing to learn about their lives. Uh, they stayed in Baltimore. What's, um, I'll get to that in a moment. This was the first Baltimore eyeglasscape sampler that I did. And the original is in the Maryland Historical Society. And Anne Barrier lived from 1811 to 1888. She was the daughter of Joseph and Jane Barrier. She grew up in Fells Point area of Baltimore. Her father was a sea captain and later a grocery and liquor shop owner. After his death, Jane assumed ownership and management of the shop. Anne followed her mother's example and managed a dry goods store on Gay Street. There, Anne met Gibbons Moore, where he came into the shop to purchase material for his mother. Anne and Gibbons were married in 1838. They lived at Moore Orchards in Howard County and had five children. During her formative years in Fells Point, Anne Barrier may have attended the Ladies' Seminary run by Martha and Francis Gardner. The school concentrated on reading, writing, arithmetic, grammar, and various native work disciplines. The Garner School was one of several that taught the eyeglass gate house sampler. So there were quite a few. We don't know them all. They're in the, quite, they were, we're going to talk about one more <laughs> when, we get to the, when we get to the end here. In the center, on top, is a wonderful red work sampler. We only call it red work because uh, we're in the red. So Mercedes Ospina, 1863, from Medellin. Columbia, South America. She attended the convent school run by Carmelite sisters. And when I first saw the sampler online at auction, 
I was confused because it's not a Spanish alphabet. But she didn't need it because she already knew the Spanish alphabet. The sisters were from France and they taught her the French and English alphabet. There's a lot of French motifs there from that time period and some ind indigenous figures. If you look at the little figure of a girl underneath the basket in the very center, and then there's some, there's an animal head. I'm not sure what that is. It looks similar to a couple of rodents that are, or, uh, that live in Colombia, but I couldn't tell you which one for sure. I tried to find out. The other adorable thing about the sampler, they're, they're, they're tiny, but there's 19 dogs on that sampler. 19 little dogs all over. It's a beautiful thing. And um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about Mercedes is she's the daughter of Mariano Spina, the president of Colombia and a coffee grower. Her brother also goes on to become president of the country. And then later on, in the 20th century, in 1940, her grand nephew, great great grand nephew, uh, is the president also of Colombia at that time. And if you uh, remember during the 60s and 70s, uh, an ad on television about Juan Valdez, which is wonderful coffee, that's that company, Cosina Coffee, whose headquarters are now in Charlotte, um, North Carolina. I hope you enjoy that. That's one of my favorite ones too. The one below it is not, is the only non-reproduction in the sampler, although you can call it an adaptation because I used motifs. I combined these things myself and I used motifs from as early as uh, the uh, 15th century here from Italy. The red, the first red one. Some of the other things are Italy here. And down there you can see some of the faces too. France, Italy, England, and a little bit of fun here from Maryland. I had to put a crab in there. And since I had a bear visiting me often while I was making it, uh, we had this roaming bear in our neighborhood for a while until the DNR captured and put him back into the uh, mountains of Maryland. Although it took him to the mountain, they didn't take him back. He was our New Jersey sampler, a New Jersey bear. He was tagged. Okay, so the other Jordan sister is here. Deanne Jordan, I glass gate. What's new on here, besides the adorable uh, order, is that gazebo. It's the first time I've seen a gazebo like that. It's trees on one of the um, high glass gate samples. Above that is Lydia Borden, Yvesham Lower School, a uh, very typical Quaker sampler from uh, school. All those motifs, the lettering, all of this just fabulous. Just a wonderful job. Lydia never married. And later on, her niece is living with her. And this is her niece's sampler, Elizabeth Borden from 1834. It might be the grand niece. I forget now. I don't have that information at hand. The sampler that I'm one of the samplers that I'm most uh, humbled by is the one on the right, and that's the Mary Pat sampler. It's from the Old Lake Sisters of Providence collection. Uh, they were the first permanent community of Roman Catholic sisters of African descent in the United States. The Oblate sisters were free women of color. In the spring of 1828, four women of African descent began a woman's religious order in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the Oblate sisters of Providence vowed to consecrate themselves to God and the Christian education of African descent girls. The original school opened with several tuition paying day students and a few boarders. While being Catholic was not an entry requirement, Religion was a major part of the curriculum, along with English, French, writing, arithmetic, sewing, and embroidery. Once the student learned her techniques, she was granted one hour in the morning before classes and one hour 
in the afternoon after classes to work on her sampler. Student tuition and sewing were the orders and school's main source of income. The curriculum taught by the Oblate sisters was characteristic of the instruction in many white private parochial schools during the time period. Many graduates of the Oblate sister school went on to make a living through their sewing. Sewing and embroidery were the main source of income for the Oblate sisters up until the 1960s. I think this is one of the most playful ones with and the most challenging house to build because our dear girl <laughs> um, made it, uh, her teacher made it a little more difficult for her when you're counting the stitches there you're actually skipping a thread on the linen to so you can yeah <laughs> so you can see the the uh, the bricks really stand out that way and I absolutely love the bird that she put on there <laughs> I don't know where she got it from but it's fabulous and all those birds um, on the original, on the original sampler, it's very stained, and in, especially in this area. And I did not see that big bird until I blew up the photos on my computer. That's how <laughs> dark it was. So it was a surprise, and uh, it's just a beautiful, fun, loving sampler. And. Let's see, uh, as the sampler indicates, Mary Petz was born about 1822. Ledgers and documents from the early Oblate community tell us that Mary Marie Petz, P-E-T-Z, was enrolled in the Oblate uh, Sisters of Providence School as a day student in May, 1830. Her name was later Americanized to P-E-T-S. Between May and September, 1830, $12 was paid for the six academic quarters from September 1830 to the spring of 1832. Her books cost an additional 37 cents. Mary received her first communion in June 1831. In August of the same year, she was one of five girls to receive a, quote, crown, unquote, for her excellent examination scores and overall scholastic performance. We believe Mary worked on her sampler during the fall term and completed it in December 1831. Mary's teacher may have been Sister Teresa, who later removed to Detroit, Michigan area and founded a woman's religious order there and a girls' school. The same embroidery and sewing tradition continued there. We have no record of Mary's life after she left the Oblate Sisters School. And we believe that Mary, Sister Teresa also went to um, Louisiana and to New Orleans, but then returned to Michigan. So let's, that's Mary Pat's, one of my favorite. And then we have the book, A Maryland Sampling and Columbia's Daughter. A lot of these samples are in these books. But in the camera, in the camera, we have on the corner, a marvelous Quaker sampler from uh, Elizabeth West. She was born 28 July 1795 in Springfield Township, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. She has an uplifting moral verse or an extract, and it's enclosed within a cartouche that is surrounded by distinctive Quaker motifs. Decorative fruit baskets, favorite tulips, rose bouquets, and a heart seeds. A coin stitch flower and strawberry flank the cartouche. Paired birds usually symbolize a token or an emblem of love in the Quaker samples. On top is Mary Pettit, the very famous girl. Only in that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going off the rails here. <laughs> Only she's very famous, and because she's one of like my top seller charts, everybody loves Martha Pettit. Uh, also Quaker, she stitched her traditional Quaker sampler in 1804 before attending Westtown School where many beautiful samplers similar to hers were created. Born in 1788 in Sadsbury in Chester County, Martha enrolled at Westtown School as student number 418 on the 22nd day, fourth month, 1805, and remained there for more than a year, leaving on the 22nd day, seventh month, 1806. She made another sampler in 1806 while at Westtown. The piece was a simple alphabet sampler that also included a row of numbers. Martha added her name at the top, and the date and the name of her school at the bottom. Martha married Charles Shaw in 1809 and had four daughters. Martha Pettit Shaw died in 1869. Martha Sampler descended through the family and was not framed until acquired by the current owner. The Sampler was sewn to 
of paper backing and carefully stored by a family members for many years. A note written on the paper backing provided a clue to researchers working to identify the correct Martha Pettit who made this sampler. And it says, thy great grandmother Shaw's handwork. We call that a granny note. And we love granny notes when people write down family information in the back or inside, whichever. The last sampler that we have to talk about right now is the Sarah Sands. And she was actually the first sampler that I ever reproduced. And she, Sarah Sands lived from 1806 to 1902 in Annapolis, Maryland. Sarah was 10 years old when she finished her sampler. Six more samplers, similar samplers with the city scene and embroidered work piece have been documented from Annapolis. The Sands House is possibly the oldest wooden building in Maryland built in 1695 on Prince George Street. It was bought by John Sands in 1771 and continues to be lived in by his descendants. And it's uh, really close to the Naval Academy, it backs up to it, it's easy to find. A newspaper article in 1901 spoke of Sarah in the following terms. Sarah Sands at the age of 95 and, oldest, and the oldest white person in Annapolis heard the first gunfire at the Battle of North Point and saw the smoke as the British burned Washington in 1814. Miss Sands, though 95, was possessed of all her faculties. She reads and sews without glasses. She hears well and is bright, is a bright and interesting talker. Sarah's obituary a year later states that she was buried in her elaborately embroidered dressing room. And that's what we have. All right, now we're ready to do the Q&A. So we're gonna have Barbara sit down. And Heather, if you would uh, ask some questions from the comments, please. Yes, we do have one question. If you have any questions, please put them in um, the chat box and we'd be happy to ask um, Barbara those questions. We just have a few minutes left. Um, but one question we have is, what got you involved in doing samplers, Barbara? Um, well, uh, in 1983, there weren't uh, too much, there weren't too many uh, kits available. Uh, I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, and the only craft needlework uh, thing that we had was called Lee Wards. They had some kits, and there was a Pennsylvania German uh, sampler that was just adorable, and I wanted to learn more about it. In fact, I made three of them, one for, <laughs> for my sister, for us, and then for my mother-in-law. And I wanted to learn more about them. And couple of years, another year later, my husband was uh, active duty military. We were transferred to headquarters here in the area. And I started going to the DAR, to the Smithsonian, just because I couldn't, I couldn't get this information online. Online wasn't happening yet. So I would go to the museums and see their collections and learn as much as I can because it was just wonderful history. I've always been a, a a fan of history, fan, yeah. I'm just nosy, I just wanna know more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, we do have a question here. What tips can you give to get modern girls into needlework? Well, just like with any artwork, hand them a needle and thread and some fabric and say, have, let's have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> I started all the, um, Many of my children at the tender age of four and five, of course, it was just, you know, uh, cardboard, not cardboard, but heavy board that I punched paper and they just did some simple little stitches all around in the shape of little coloring books, you know, like a, a butterfly or a heart or something real simple. And I know that's a little bit young, but even if you go up to, uh, but you use a big plastic needle at that point, uh, like a yarn needle and uh, some yarn, just some simple things so they get the idea because most of the children want to do what you're doing if they see you doing it, all of mine have and the grandchildren. So, but the, and, and there's other ways of getting them involved in any kind of artwork. They could do a piece of artwork themselves, a simple little drawing, and then turn that into 
uh, you know, punch hole around and then they can cut, you know, do an outline, simple outline stitch or something like that. I'm talking young, young, young. But yeah, did it, I hope I answered that question. Also, can you tell us again the name of the sampler that's in the fireplace? Oh, that's Maria Januaria, 1833, and she's Portuguese sampler. Um, also on your website? Yeah, yeah, it'll be up on the website. It's on my website, yeah, as a reproduction. And, I sh and we should say that it's from Portugal, I think. And you can always send me an email too, and I will promise to answer. Yeah, and the email is in the chat. Um, Barbara's email is in the chat, should anybody uh, need that. It's also on my website as uh, an easy way to contact me. Terrific. Um, and then one other question. Uh, who got you started in um, needlework and needlepoint? Or well, was there someone or something? My, my grandmother taught me how to uh, do freestyle embroidery when I was very young. She had me um, write out my name and then I had to uh, stitch uh, a, an outline stitch or a stem stitch or chain stitch eventually, any one of those, just to uh, keep going with your needle. Because with any craft, with any art, the more you do something, the more you practice, the better you get at it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to do more at that, at that time. She wasn't living with us at the time, so I had to have to go and visit her to do that. Because my mom was pretty busy. She had a full-time job, even in early on in the early 60s. So it's not, moms aren't always uh, able to be that helpful. That's why. When, you, when I talk about the girls um, and the, the sampler makers, they were sent to school, their parents sent them to school because mom was a little busy, so was they, you know, doing other things. Terrific. Um, and how have you helped people uncover their family histories through samplers? Oh, well, some people don't know whether the sampler that they have in their collect in their in their collection or just in their home, is a uh, family, uh, is, was a, just, uh, a, a, an ancestor. And there are many ways to find that out. You need to know your genealogy. You need to know uh, where your family came from. One of the things that uh, is, is easiest for me, yes, I do do the records. I go through ancestry.com. And if I can't find it in those databases, I go to my library goddess. Ms. Cindy Steinhoff, who is a library director at the uh, Anne Arundel Community College in uh, Anne Arundel County, Maryland. And she can get into databases we mere mortals cannot. But she's very good when she's not busy. <laughs> very helpful to me. Ancestry.com is a huge, wonderful thing to go through, but you need to learn how to navigate it too. Uh, so you want to find out about the, the family and you want to, one of the things that I do a little bit more so is I can identify a school, a sampler, uh, an area where it's from at least and start that way. It's really great if I can identify a school right off and then we don't have to look everywhere. We can just look at this one. Sure. Are we okay? One last question and then we'll close up. Is there a good guide to telling you what all the different sampler motifs mean? Well, there's several guides. There's several, um, and in, in the symbolism is usually um, religious. Uh, in different countries, different cultures, it means different things, but a lot of times it kind of means the same thing going through. Uh, there are several different books out on symbolism and samplers. Um, I would say just Google samplers symbolism and see what pops up. There's quite a bit out there. I suppose I should get a better list. <laughs> Combine one. One more thing to do. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Barbara. We really appreciate your time today and sharing your expertise and knowledge, which is vast. Um, that's about all the time we have today. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending and
for the questions that we had. And a special thank you again to Barbara for coming, speaking with us today. If you're interested in any of the designs you saw here today, you can purchase them on Barbara's website at queenstownsamplerdesigns.com. No? Not all of them. Not they, all of them. Not, they have to purchase them through a shop that uh, buys them. I can't buy, can't buy them from my website. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so they'll, they can get them through different shops? Which I have on our website, we have a very big list of all the wonderful stores that carry our designs. Oh, terrific. And if you're coming to the Needlework Show here at Woodlawn, just up the road is In Stitches, run by Miss Ellen Myers, who does a fabulous job, and she has all my charts. <laughs> terrific. Um, and if you're interested in more programs at Woodlawn and Pope Leahy, we do have another virtual needlework program this coming Wednesday called Passing on the Tradition of Needle Arts Community Conversations. And it's at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. We invite you to bring your own needlework or heirlooms and share your stories. Uh, we would love for you to stop by in person at the Needlework Show to see all of the entrants this year. If you can't make it in person, we will have a virtual version of the Needlework Show available starting April 15th. Thank you again to those of you who have donated, and if you haven't, please consider it today. Um, in about a half hour, you should receive an email with a link uh, and a survey about the program. Survey should only take about two minutes to complete. Please take the time to fill it out so that we can improve our programs. Thank you again for coming and have a good night. And thank you again, Barbara. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Have a good night, everyone.